Well, good morning, everybody. Um, what a pleasure to be in person in lovely sunny Birmingham and not on a Zoom screen. Apologies to the people that are joining us on a Zoom screen. Um, just based on what um, Maeve and um, Lara have just said, when I was interested as a secondary school student in studying Egyptology, I remember several people said to me, go to a university that has a decent collection because this is the main way you're going to access um, ancient Egyptian material culture is having the privilege of uh, looking at it. So I uh, work at the University of Manchester, the Manchester Museum. I'll tell you a bit um, more about it in a second, but it's not traditionally a teaching collection. We do teaching, of course, we support a lot of teaching, but it doesn't quite function in the same way as Liverpool, for example, or Birmingham or other uh, universities with uh, archaeological teaching collections because the University of Manchester functions as the civic museum for the city. We don't have a comparable uh, encyclopedic collection in the city. Um, so that the university is focused, at least in part, on presenting that kind of universal story. But we are very self-conscious about how we present these stories. I'm sure we'll discuss this more and more. Um, and this is the reason I've titled this presentation Challenging Constructions, because ancient Egypt seems like this ready-made gift. Is it sexy and it's exotic and it's golden and it's uh, mysterious and there are hieroglyphs and there are known historical personalities. It seems to be a gift to get the punters into exhibitions and to interest students. That's great, <laughs> but it's a challenge, therefore, um, to try and <laughs> sidestep that very easy narrative and be more critical about the presentation uh, of a past culture. So the, I'm, I'm sure many of you have been, we're situated uh, right in the middle of the campus. And that's something I think that's worth thinking about. It's something we certainly think about at Manchester, having this kind of civic role, the kind of city museum role on a campus is not ideal because for a lot of people, not of the type in this room, a university campus is not where you go. You just don't go there. So we want to appeal to a broad audience and to bring people, you know, the 10, 15 minutes down Oxford Road from the nearest train, train station is something of a challenge. But I'm sure as um, colleagues in Birmingham and other places know, being part of the university system allows access to research, access to expertise that otherwise we wouldn't have. And I know my predecessors um, in the past have certainly made use of this possibility of multidisciplinarity when it comes to examining, researching and presenting the collection. So I should say um, the Manchester Museum, in terms of volume of collection, remember, most of these things are insects. We have two million insects, um, and generally most of it is natural history. Maybe about 100,000 uh, items uh, relate to human cultures, but in pure number terms, well, we are the largest university uh, collection in Britain. Of that, just over 18,000 objects come from ancient Egypt and Sudan. And it's a very significant collection. Of course, I would say that I'm terribly biased, but it comes from archae largely archaeological, archaeologically contexted um, settings. And there is some, although people often overestimate how much there is, there is some archival material with it, which otherwise wouldn't exist beyond the published excavation reports. I'm pleased to say it is widely used for research already and we do use it for teaching, of course. Increasingly, my own interests have followed the interests of, I guess, to an extent, the sector and certainly Manchester uh, Museum in challenging the colonial context of its um, acquisition and the, the idea of finds distribution. So I said most of the material comes from archaeological excavations because in the 1880s, the British and the French who were essentially ruling Egypt decided that up to 50% of fines could leave Egypt, things which were felt to be surplus to uh, requirements. 
So there's a whole colon colonial context to what came into the collection legally. And then there are separate issues, of course, with things which were formerly part of private collections. And there is, I was just saying to Carolyn, the context of the Eaton Myers collection impinges really nicely, nicely if that's the right word, on the acquisition of a big chunk of non-archaeologically excavated material from Egypt in Manchester. The two collectors knew each other, and so there, there's probably more work to be done there in the archive. And historically, and when I say historically, I mean back to the beginning of the 20th century, and more recently from the 1970s, there has been a big focus on human remains. Uh, my predecessor, Professor Rosalie David, really put Manchester on the map, but through the lens of mummy studies. And so we are still living, I think, with the legacy of our stated focus on, on mummified material, and I will come back to that point again. So all of these issues um, present themselves. Manchester Museum has recently, I would say, engaged pretty seriously in the decolonization debate. We have repatriated material uh, to indigenous groups in Australia. And so we have a curator now of indigenous perspectives. I was delighted to welcome my uh, new colleague uh, last week, um, Dr. Njibulo Chipangura, who comes to us from Zimbabwe, who's the new curator of anthropology. So we're critically evaluating uh, the big uh, white men, usually, who have been responsible for forming the collection. And any presentation on the history of Manchester Museum's collection has to mention this guy, the guy on the left, but also his wife, memorialized in these sepulchral <laughs> marble busts uh, from the, the early 20th century. Jesse Howarth um, and his wife, so the story goes, read Amelia Edwards' book uh, published in the 1870s, a thousand miles up the Nile, and fell in love with ancient Egypt, took a trip out and started not collecting privately, but supporting the work of one archaeologist in particular, William Matthew Flinders Petrie, who in the past has been praised as the father of Egyptian archaeology and is uh, now um, subject to a little more nuanced critique. But fundamentally, it's Manchester cotton money that formed the collection. That's, that's the bottom line here. The reason we've got such a big and significant collection is because Howarth and his wife, she gave, after her husband's death, um, Mrs. Howarth gave a lot more money towards housing, curating, <laughs> looking after the collection. She was less interested in acquisition for its own sake. And so... Thanks to Howarth, and though not entirely thanks to him, there were other sponsors involved. Uh, the museum opened an extension in 1912. Uh, this is the scene in 1912. This is the first curator, Winifred Crompton, um, <laughs> who was the museum's printer, but who was a, an avid Egyptophile and who uh, was promoted to being uh, the assistant curator for archaeology. First galleries largely based on the finds of, of Petrie and centering on one particular tomb group, a Middle Kingdom, circa 1850 BCE perhaps, a tomb group uh, from Middle Egypt, a site called Diarifa. A hundred years later, um, the galleries have changed quite a bit. They're still in the same space, the same physical space, but the tomb group of the so-called Two Brothers uh, remains uh, central here. So my own uh, involvement in the history of Manchester Museum begins here. I started towards the end of 2011. Uh, my predecessor had pretty much conceptualized these galleries and I inherited those plans. Now there are things I would change and we're hoping uh, to refresh these galleries. I've been having meetings about it this week because Manchester Museum, these galleries in particular have been closed for four years, regardless of the pandemic, because we have a major capital project underway in its final stages, which hopefully will end next February when we reopen. And so we will have a new South Asia gallery, we'll have a new China gallery, and we'll have a gallery on the concept of belonging. So this is going to make 
even a gallery that's 10 years old look rather old fashioned, I suspect. So I'm super conscious of that, but also it's a great opportunity as a curator to reflect the thinking, the growing, the change in my own perceptions that have happened in 10 years. I was just a little baby, fresh out of uh, a PhD at Liverpool University when I was thrown into this gallery, didn't really know the collection and, and, and did the, the best job I could, but no one <laughs> um, you know, can avoid being a self-critic. So this will be an opportunity to, to, to reflect some of the research that's been done in the last 10 years on uh, the collection. I have to mention these chaps because I think this, this really focuses issues about research that's done on, on collections themselves, sector-wide changes in attitude, and also how we reflect that in teaching. So these are by any measure very display worthy, beautifully executed pieces of um, craftsmanship. The inner coffins of two men called Nachtank and Knacht, better known as uh, the two brothers. They were unwrapped in a public unwrapping, um, the, the, the subject of which I receive emails about every month. There hasn't been a month, I don't think, that's gone by when someone hasn't asked for an image of the unwrapping or has questions about it. And then a few years ago, within the university context at Manchester itself, we did um, a DNA test to see if the men were in fact brothers or half brothers. And that opened up a whole issue. And it's something I've thought a lot about and have I've got into in, in, in my own research about how we tend to present, certainly at Manchester, we tend to present science in archaeology as an unalloyed good. Science is great. You can tell lots of things about uh, the ancient past based on science. Science tells us things we didn't know before. What I'm now thinking is, you know, the ancient idea of these men was that their bodies had become perfected after death. They had become gods. That's why they're showing, wearing that iconography, the iconography of divine kingship, but also of out and out godliness. I should say at this point, my predecessor at Manchester Museum, uh, Christina Riggs, has written very provocatively um, and very informatively about this subject, based partly on her experiences actually curating the Manchester collection. So now, rather than transmitting scientific facts, as we have tended to do in the past, certainly the old galleries pre 2010 were very focused on the research of another predecessor, um, Rosalie David. Instead of presenting these as, as simple, bald facts, we are trying now, the director is very keen uh, to drill down into the nuances of ancient identity, modern ideas about race, and um, looking for ancestry and all these wider issues uh, that are present in society. So just to take an example, in the old gallery, so pre-2010, uh, there were facial reconstructions. Now, Manchester itself claims very proudly to have a key role in the invention of this te technique that puts a face on the past. So these are facial reconstructions done of the two brothers, uh, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but the public do generally quite like them. Now, these were done, these are an early example of, of this technique from the 1970s done by Richard Neve. He became quite famous in the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s for producing these uh, faces. He and the then curator of archaeology wrote a book called Making Faces. But now I'm quite keen to yeah, question this as a, a means of investigating the past. So I've got to give you this wonderful quote. Um, this is from an interview with Richard Neve. This is not his own. Uh, writing it's a quoted um, piece of speech he gave to a, a historian of the history of Egyptology in Manchester he said we spent an entire weekend casting the skulls these are the skulls of the two brothers two brothers had been unwrapped in, in 1908 they were essentially just skeletonized and the skeletons were the subject of intense study one was easier than the other 
uh, which had been coated in some sort of glue or something. Nowadays, we wouldn't get away with it. We had to improvise big time. Nowadays, we use the same materials, but we're better at it. I built some faces on these two skulls, very crude. I made some drawings, but it's hard without the skin. Oddly enough, people found it quite interesting. So he's admitting that this was an experimental technique which passed into absolute fact. These are what the men looked like. They are, of course, massively subjective. There are so many factors that affect uh, one's appearance, but because it was in a museum and Manchester Museum was very proud of its role in, in um, a technique which is always what well, tends to be allied to forensic techniques and, you know, hard science more hard science than the speculations of Egyptology, these were really very popular. And I often say the people who need to see facial reconstructions are the people that need to see the movies of books. They, they can't visualize themselves an, an ancient person. They need to see a real um, face. So um, this, for me, offers a great opportunity. Um, so in the last couple of months with colleagues at the museum, we have uncovered almost 100 facial reconstructions or versions of facial reconstructions uh, that were made in, a, in, a, in an, an attempt to put things on display, but they show such wild variation in what the ancient people looked like. Um, so we're now working on a, a new display, which rather than saying, here's what people in the past looked like, it's here are all the subjective things that were used to create these images, which tend to be an image in the mind of the person doing the creating, not some kind of absolute fact, some window into the past. So that's going on at the moment. I just wanted to reflect on a couple of experiences we've had with exhibitions. Um, and this has gone on to affect interpretation of the gallery, um, the permanent galleries and teaching and research. So uh, I know there's some fans of animal mummies in the museum, uh, in the room. Um, a few years ago, this is a benefit definitely of working at the University of Manchester. Some colleagues were involved in the Ancient Egyptian Animal Biobank project. They were awarded uh, Leverhulme funding, which came with a, a not, not, um, not insignificant amount of money to put on an exhibition. The then director of Manchester Museum was very keen and we turned it into a tour. Initially, it was meant to go um, to three venues, it was extended. Um, and the research was based on challenging the perception that animal mummies were pets. There is a common, still quite common idea that the ancient Egyptians were great animal lovers. And of course they were worshiping cats and all that stuff. But my colleagues who'd gone around and examined a lot of this material in British and some American collections discovered that most of these mummies, and there were tens of millions of them known uh, to have been produced, were given as gifts to the gods, as votives. Um, large numbers of animals, crocodiles, cats, you name it, um, had been raised, it seems, specifically for slaughter. So they were drowning kittens and snapping kittens' necks at an extraordinary rate. So this idea, this Western, um, uh, very comfortable idea of oh, the ancient Egyptians are great cat lovers, of course, is yet another imposition on the ancient evidence. So the research was really interesting. The results were really interesting. It used a lot of, dare I say, scientific techniques. Um, so we featured this in a, a touring exhibition. Um, we have quite a significant collection ourselves. And I know colleagues in this, this room donated not donated, but lent, I should know the distinction between those terms, uh, lent uh, some, some objects from their collections as part of this uh, three venue tour, animal mummies, uh, gifts for the uh, gods. Uh, so my academic co-curators, uh, Lydia and Stephanie, both based at the University of Manchester, really a, a productive collaboration because they had, through their own research, all these contacts, uh, with lending institutions and were able to um, uh, have those conversations in a way I couldn't have done if I'd come up with the idea of the exhibition myself. They produced a very nice book to accompany it, uh, which is just as much about 
British attitudes in the 19th century as it is uh, about ancient Egypt. We worked with a, a really great designer, freelance designer called Andrew Guess, who understood immediately, who got the idea of the exhibition and understood that it was to reflect active current research, but also understood that we wanted to make it popular with the public. So these are images from um, animal mummy catacombs, one on the left at the site of Saqqara, the site of, you know, millions, literally millions of bird mummies that were in kilometers of underground tunnels deposited in pottery vessels. And then a site uh, on the right, one which I only visited for the first time uh, a few weeks ago um, in Middle Egypt, it's in Tuna El Gebel, which also had mummified birds, but also mummified baboons. So we spliced these, these archival sources together um, to create a kind of immersive experience that I hope not only provides the, an insight into what were the ancient Egyptians doing or attempting to do when they were making animal mummies, but also representing what it is to do research on them. Um, I'm working with two female co-curators and thinking about women in STEM, it generated a whole series of events and interesting engagements that I would never have been able to come up with had I done it uh, myself. It was also a chance to capture, in rather an unusual way, public responses to what we were doing. So we had a traditional visitor book, but we also set up, I don't have a photo of it here, um, what we called a votive interactive where we had three gods that you could send messages to. And although this was done secretly, privately, you know, you were posting your message into the catacomb and um, you assumed uh, no one would read it. Of course, we did read the <laughs> messages and they showed a very particular engagement with the understanding of what the exhibition was about and why you would be giving gifts to the gods. And they reflected an understanding of each god having their own particular association. So the god Thoth is associated with writing and learning. The god Sobek, a crocodile, uh, was associated with fertility in some way and rapacious revenge in another. So the, um, the kind of requests, some of them quite earnest requests uh, to gods did gen generally um, reflect this. So we're hoping to publish a a review of all this evidence in uh, museum and society in the next few months. It was also a chance to try and break down categories for the public between um, statue, mummy, uh, animal, because animals were in some way living avatars of the gods. Um, and it was such a simple thing. I don't think I'd, I'd ever seen it done in a museum before. We rewrapped a bronze figurine of, a, um, of the goddess Isis uh, suckling her son, the god Horus, um, as was standard practice, the statuary would have been wrapped in linen uh, before deposition in a tomb, in a temple context, in a, in a votive deposit. And it was just a way of, of, of questioning this idea of what is a mummy in ancient Egypt. And it did, I think it did in some ways work in terms of public response. The exhibition was pretty successful. It was meant to do those first three venues. It opened in Manchester, it went to Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow, and then it was meant to finish at World Museum in Liverpool. Um, it ended up going to Wigan, a, na a National Trust uh, property in Lyme Park, and then Natural History Museum Tring. And it really was something that ended up influencing our teaching sessions at the museum itself. So we had a whole raft of new x-rays and CT scans, archival information that really produced a much more nuanced set of resources, both for our standard kind of primary school teaching syllabus, um, but also for seminars, and it invited a lot more researchers into um, the space to look at the collection. So it was a success, not just in terms of people coming into a museum and seeing a nice exhibition, but an impact on our research and teaching activities. So having done that, knowing we were closing towards the end of 2018, initially just partially and then completely, 
Um, we came up with the idea of doing not just a national touring show, but an international touring show focused on a real strength of our collection, which is Greco-Roman uh, material from Egypt, particularly the site of Hawara. So this is because Jesse Howarth was supporting Flinders Petrie. Flinders Petrie was working at one particular site, which was yielding a lot of very fine uh, material uh, of Greco-Roman date. So the last centuries BCE into the first century CE, when Egypt was ruled by the uh, Greek kings called, uh, with the name Ptolemy into the um, annexation of Egypt by the Roman Empire. So this launched in February 2020 in Buffalo, in New York State, and it was a chance, A, to get the collection properly photographed, God, never underestimate the power of a decent photograph, um, to support uh, interpretation, but also to support uh, publications. And it was, for me, a deeply rewarding chance to explore the colonial history of the collection and how people and why people are so obsessed with mummies and so the tour as you can see on these dates was it was meant to go around three u.s venues one dropped out the pandemic hit it was a total show <laughs> in every sense but then we had interest from china so we moved uh, the exhibition to china it's currently on lockdown in shanghai but it is expected to go to a last a venue before it returns to Manchester at the beginning of next year. It was rewarding also because a lot of the material was in storage, it hadn't been um, seen before, and since the exhibition launched, and as I'll show you in a company in book, the number of research and teaching requests we've had for that has skyrocketed. Manchester uh, University does offer as part of its ancient history uh, course uh, courses on Greco-Roman Egypt, so this this was a was a nice connection between what had been planned for teaching anyway and what was suddenly um, much more better known, much better photographed um, in terms of of display quality uh, photography. And the thing, just personally as an Egyptologist, that I found satisfying was bringing objects of Ptolemaic and Roman date together with decent photos of sites. There's a lot of surviving temples in Egypt date to those periods, to the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. So the people buried at Hawara with all these beautiful objects were alive at the same time these uh, temples were being built and were functioning. So Egyptologically very satisfying. With an exhibition called Golden Mummies of Egypt, however, you have an expectation uh, that people are going to be able to see mummies. There were no unwrapped mummies on display. Most of them were pretty heavily decorated, but for three of them in the US and in China, we did provide um, CT scan information, which enabled um, the partial unwrapping of the mummies. We've taken the decision at Manchester that there will be no CT scan or X-ray information at all. There will be audio and visual interactive to explain the decoration, but it is quite a bold choice for a museum that is so well known as a pioneer of mummy studies. And it'll be interesting to see what reaction we get, um, not just from the public generally, but from uh, students and uh, people on campus generally. In the original designs of the exhibition, we tried to contextualize what was going on with you know, big audiovisual screens. So we had three small cinema theatres set up explaining Egyptian gods, Egyptian temples, and the colonial history of archaeology. That's great when you're in a thousand metre square space exhibition hall in Beijing. It's not so good, albeit in a still very impressive new um, temporary exhibition gallery at Manchester. So there's some thinking to be done about how we condense that information that additional information into the space we've got and how we might deliver it through uh, public programming, hopefully also through um, teaching and ways of encouraging uh, research. This is an image I just love from, <laughs> from uh, the, the US run of the, the, the show where it proved very popular, especially during the pandemic, but it also provided a chance. To, this is um, an image from colleagues at North Carolina Museum of Art 
it given they were showing the 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 exhibition about mummies at the height of the pandemic they did use that as a springboard to have discussions about loss and bereavement which we don't tend to mix those two um at least at manchester so that got us thinking about how we might be using our collections more generally so the show will i uh, hope people will be able to come and see it currently it's only european venue will be in manchester when we reopen in the middle of february next year there's an accompanying book which is only available through the university of manchester museum online bookshop it is not in any good bookshop near you, uh, but worth it. if you're interested in the issues I'm talking about, I highly recommend it. Um, but just thinking about using collections in the theme of this uh, discussion today, of course, a lot of us have been in the pandemic using audiovisual means of communication. Certainly, I should say at Manchester Museum, for several years before the pandemic, we had a very active and successful suite of online courses, which we were, the museum was supplying content for that anyway. Um, so uh, Joyce Tilsley, now Nikki Nielsen, uh, are taking that course in, in new and exciting directions at Manchester. So I was happy to contribute to that. So that had been going on for a few years, but then when the pandemic struck, I took to Periscope. And yes, I do have a Blue Peter badge. It was for mummifying an orange, live on Blue Peter. And I did actually utter the words, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so that's why I've got the badge. Um, but it was a weekly thing and it was the idea of our press officer to invite questions every week, ask an Egyptologist. That started up open, opening up whole new areas of how we might communicate uh, the collections. And so based on the experience of what we called Egyptology at home, uh, we applied to the Edna Fairburn uh, collections fund to specifically think about how to communicate collections on big themes like touch because people weren't able to touch one another um, like loss and bereavement and resilience and so we were very um, grateful to receive uh, some funding for objects that we felt really targeted these themes and at the beginning of the pandemic to be honest with you you know, uh, care homes were in the news. Um, the basic idea was we were going to run these sessions in care homes and we were going to match up. We're going to buddy up care homes and primary schools. And I would never have believed it possible at the start of the pandemic, but we had the last proper session for our first suite of sessions last week. And it was singularly one of the most inspiring things I've ever done in my museum career was getting objects out, working with um, people in um, in a, a residential setting. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it, I wouldn't describe it as a care home, but assisted living facility and working with kids at primary school. And then because the two groups have worked with the same objects, bringing them together was really, really something very rewarding. So you can find out more about this online. Um, I'm also very grateful, all these photos I'm showing uh, were taken by my friend and colleague, uh, Julia Thorne, who is an archaeological photographer. Uh, she photographs and she um, trades under the name Teddy Sherry, which is really worth uh, looking out if you're interested in archaeological photography. But, you know, to, thinking about res resilience um, and healing, because the whole project was to have it to heal, We've got this fantastic sculpture of the lion, the rapacious lion goddess Sekhmet, but we've also got dozens of beautiful little amulets of uh, hers. And you can't take the, the big colossal statues <laughs> out to, uh, to community groups, but you can take a little um, amulet. Oh, the responses to this little piece. Can you see under the goddess's throne, these are little serpents with their fists up. So they are literally fighting against whatever enemies you want Sekhmet to be directed against it. It's the kind of detail which you would completely miss on display, but which with a decent photograph, thanks to Julia, brought about a 45 minute conversation uh, with uh, people in this assisted living facility. Magic wands, um, sorry, magic wands. Ugh, I hate the kind of Harry Potter implication of the term magic wand. 
birth tusks or um, uh, some kind of apotropaic weapon. Uh, these are the tusks of hippos, again, that benefited from uh, good photography and which really fascinated both the primary school um, and the, the older people we were uh, working with. And just one final uh, detail before I can stop. Examining all of these things out of the display case, um, I connected some, some research inquiries uh, that I'd had about how they've been marked and then reworked. So can you see there's a serpent there? Um, there are scores on this and other objects where it looked like someone had attempted to in some way deactivate uh, the images on the object. It just opened up a whole range of questions which we were then able to feed into undergraduate teaching sessions. So the experience of doing the To Have and To Heal project, which is community group orientated, directly influenced uh, sessions we subsequently ran with traditional archaeological student uh, teaching audiences. So finally, um, as we prepare for reopening, we are not going to do a massive redisplay of the ancient worlds that are archaeology and Egyptology galleries, but we are thinking about how to use mass display and connect with projects like To Have and To Heal. So the directors can say, here are all the objects we have and here are, how, here are some of the ways we're intending and have been um, in the past using them. So I'll stop there and say thank you very much and I'll take any questions.